Thanks for the warm welcome, but I'm here to tell you about something terrible. <laughs> but you have to know about this problem because then we can solve it together. Here's our beautiful planet. But after a nuclear war, it might look like this, with smoke covering the planet, blocking out the sun, and making it cold and dark at the Earth's surface. And this would produce a nuclear winter. That is, the temperatures would get below freezing, even in the summertime, which would kill all the crops and produce a global famine. We discovered this working in the 1980s. This is the most important work I've ever done as a, as a climate scientist. And what the, the good news about that, that this could be produced, is that this helped to change the world. Here's a graph showing the number of nuclear weapons on the planet. And there used to be zero, then there were two, then the US started the first nuclear war, then there were zero, and then the number started going up. And the US number went up, and the Russians caught up. And in the 1980s, there were 70,000 nuclear weapons on the planet. The arms race was going crazy. And this research came out, and it was done jointly by Russian and American scientists getting the same results. And so it couldn't be considered propaganda from one side or the other. And I published a paper the next year, uh, and, uh, whoops. and then the Soviet Union ended five years later. So people say, why did the arms race end? It wasn't because the Soviet Union ended. Maybe part of it was because of demonstrations or the Soviet Union was running out of money, but there was really a lot of controversy about this nuclear winter research, and people started realizing how horrible the direct effects of nuclear war would be, and then arms race ended. And why do I tell you that it was because of nuclear winter? Because you can ask the person that made the decision. Mikhail Gorbachev was interviewed in, in the year 2000, and he said, you know, models made by Russian and American scientists show that a nuclear war would result in a nuclear winter. It would be extremely destructive to all life on Earth. The knowledge of that was a great stimulus to us, to people of honor and morality, to act in that situation. So you might think, OK, the problem's solved. The number of weapons are going down. But actually, the number of countries with weapons is going up. It used to be one country every five years would, would have nuclear weapons. The Soviet Union ended. There were some countries that had them and didn't want them and gave them back. But then Pakistan and North Korea got them. There are nine countries now with nuclear weapons. And even though it's going down, there's still a lot of them on the planet. The US and Russia each have about 10,000. And the other countries with them have chosen to stop at 100 or 200. How many nuclear weapons do you have to drop on the capital of your enemy in order for, to deter them from attacking you? One, that's correct. Maybe you need two in case the first one doesn't, doesn't work. So why do you need thousands of them? These other countries figure a couple hundred is more than enough. But it also brings up the question, what would happen if they fought a nuclear war? Now, there's 32 more countries that could build them if they wanted to. They have the uranium or plutonium that they need. It's not a secret how to do it, but they've chosen not to. So what happens when there's a nuclear weapon? When it goes off, it's like bringing a piece of the sun to the surface of the Earth for a fraction of a second. It's so bright, everything nearby catches on fire, bursts into flames. And it's the smoke from the fires that will go up in the atmosphere and block out the sun and stay for, for, almost a, for more than a decade that would cause the effects of nuclear war. More people in countries that didn't have bombs dropped on them would die than people in where the bombs had the direct effects. Now, here's a photo uh, drawing done by one of the survivors of Hiroshima. And what they remember is the fires. And this is what Hiroshima looked like afterwards. There were no, no more buildings. They all went up in flames. And here's a uh, cartoon of what some of these plumes of smoke might look like after a nuclear war started. So uh, seven years ago at a conference, Brian Toon and Rich Turco, the people that invented the term nuclear winter, told me that somebody asked them, what would happen if India and Pakistan fought a nuclear war? They've each got about 100 nuclear weapons. And we calculated how much smoke you would get from the fires, and it turns out it would be quite a bit. It would be 5 million tons of smoke. Imagine along the Kashmir border, there's some uh, Rush, uh, Ind Indian soldier there and, and a Pakistani soldier, and they get in some sort of disagreement, and it just goes out of control. And because of fear or panic or miscommunication, it develops into a nuclear war. 
So I said to them, I said, that's interesting. Who's going to calculate the climate response to the 5 million tons of smoke? They said, well, we thought maybe you would. <laughs> and I had a student, Luke Oman, who was ready to do that. He was studying volcanic eruptions and climate, and so that's what we did. We asked, what would happen if 100 uh, nuclear bombs were dropped in India and Pakistan on targets that would produce smoke? This is much less than 1% of the current nuclear arsenal. We use these very small Hiroshima-sized bombs because that's what we know are the easiest to make. It would be a horrible. 20 million people would die from the direct effects of the blast, the reactivity, and the fires. But it would produce this 5 million tons of smoke. So we put it into a climate model, the same ones we use to calculate global warming, effects of volcanic eruptions. And here's a movie showing what would happen. Uh, the smoke is coming out and spreading around the world. And this is the vertical distribution. So this is the tropopause. Beneath here, there's rain to wash it out. But it gets heated by the sun. It's black and lofted up into the upper atmosphere, into the stratosphere, where it would stay, we discovered, for more than a decade. We were surprised how long it would stay. So uh, then we looked at what would be the effects of this on the climate. So we did a calculate in our model. We looked at the uh, climate response. This is a graph of the global average temperature, the global warming that we're quite concerned about, rightly so. If this smoke went in the atmosphere, it would rapidly plummet the temperatures to below little ice age changes. Now, first of all, this is not a solution to global warming. Uh, uh, that, that's called geoengineering, and people have proposed putting a, a layer of particles like volcanoes do, and that wouldn't kill anybody. It's still not a good idea, but uh, this would produce climate change unprecedented in recorded human history. And it would uh, uh, get temperatures below what it was in the Little Ice Age. So we said, what would happen then to the crops? So we took temperature and precipitation and sunlight changes and put it into a model that calculates crop productivity. Here's an example. In China, the crop productivity in China for rice would get 25% below the normal, which is the black line, for five years and even 20% for another five years. This, would be, this means China would only grow the amount of rice that they had when they had 300 million fewer people than they have now. And the same thing would happen in other places. We did calculations in the United States. And here's a table of some of our results. Uh, corn production in the US, soybean production, 10 or 15%, 20% below normal for a decade. This would be a global food crisis. Pe people trade food around the world. Remember a couple years ago, there were these fires and drought in Russia. It uh, got very hot in Moscow. They stopped exporting wheat because it affected their wheat crops. So people would stop trading. Rich countries might be able to do OK, but countries that depend on imported food would have huge problems. And if they knew that this effect was going to happen, it would really be a, a global panic. Now, there's about a billion people now that have chronic malnutrition. And so they might really be severely affected and maybe uh, 2 billion people might be dead from starvation. From a nuclear war fought around the other side of the world between India and Pakistan with a tiny fraction of our current arsenal because the smoke would cover the world and stay there for a long time. Ira Helfand, a colleague of mine, wrote an article about this. He called it Nuclear Famine. And he was able to show this report to Mikhail Gorbachev last year. And Gorbachev said, I'm convinced that nuclear weapons must be abolished. Their use in military conflict is unthinkable. Using them to achieve political objectives is immoral. Over 25 years ago, President Reagan and I ended our summit meeting in Geneva with a joint statement that nuclear war cannot be won and must never be fought. And this new study underscores in stunning and disturbing detail why this is the case. But it's a lot worse than that. This is a US Trident submarine. It has about 100 nuclear weapons, much bigger than the ones we use in this simulation. Maybe 1,000 Hiroshima's on each submarine. And the US has 14 of them. And that's less than half of our arsenal. And the Russians have, a, have an arsenal about the same size. So we went back and said, what would be the effects on climate if the US and Russia had a war today with the current arsenals? And this would produce a much larger cloud of smoke, causing much larger climate change. And it could still produce nuclear winter today. You could still bring temperatures below freezing in the summertime, and there would be no agriculture around the world. And we calculated what would happen to the globe, 
and the, I now had to rescale the, the figure. The red line is what I showed you before. The green and brown are what would happen for f not 5 million tons, but 50 million tons or 150 million tons of smoke, which is still possible today. It would indeed be a little ice age. It would be a tragedy for the entire planet. What I've been telling you about so far is theory. It's calculations done with a climate model. We don't actually want to test this in the real world. <laughs> so how can we tell if it's right? We look at analogs. We look at things that have happened that can inform us about it, such as nighttime. <laughs> when it gets nighttime, it gets cold, and, 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 or the seasonal cycles, which gave the name to it, nuclear winter. Or we can look at forest fires that actually can pump smoke up into the stratosphere. Or we look at volcanic eruptions. Here's one of my favorite paintings by Edward Monk. It's the red and yellow is the volcanic sunset that he saw over the Oslo Harbor in 1883 after the Krakatau eruption. And 10 years later, he painted this, this famous painting, and that's how I, I feel about this. And so, uh, so we can learn about this from volcanic eruptions. The Tambora eruption took place in 1815. And the next year was called the year without a summer. The climate was about a couple degrees Fahrenheit colder around the world because of the effects of this volcanic eruption. That summer in 1816, Mary Shelley, Percy Shelley, and, and Lord Byron were taking their vacation in this house on the shores of Lake Geneva. And they wanted to go hiking and boating, but it was cold and dark and gloomy, and they couldn't go outside. So they said, well, we're, we're writers. Let's try and have a contest to see who can write the scariest ghost story. And Mary Shelley wrote Frankenstein, inspired by the climatic effects of a volcanic eruption. Now, Byron didn't write a book, but he wrote a poem called Darkness, which I learned about from Russian scientists in the 1980s who had read it in a Russian translation. And it sounds just like nuclear winter. I had a dream, which was not all a dream. The bright sun was extinguished, and the stars had wandered darkling in the eternal space, rayless and pathless. And the icy earth swung blind and blackening in the moonless air. And morn came and went and came and brought no day. And men forgot their passions in the dread of this their desolation. And all hearts were chilled into a selfish prayer for light. And they did live by watchfires and the thrones, the palaces of crowned kings, the huts, the habitants of all things which dwell were burnt for beacons, cities were consumed. So what does this mean? Uh, Brian Toon and I last year wrote an article called Self-Assured Destruction. We used to think it was mutually assured destruction, that if one country attacked the other, the other would attack you back and everybody would die and that would deter you from attacking. But now it turns out the use of nuclear weapons would be suicidal. If you attacked another country and they did nothing, the smoke from those fires would come back and get you. So you can't use them. You can't use nuclear weapons. Why do we keep so many? Now, President Obama and President Medvedev signed a, the New START agreement in Prague in 2010. And this pledged each country to go down to about 2,000 nuclear weapons by 2017. But our calculations showed that would still be enough to produce nuclear winter. And so we really need to get rid of them much faster than that. Faster than that. Only nuclear disarmament will prevent, will prevent this possibility of this catastrophe. And Obama, you might remember last week, offered to bring the US arsenal down by about a third. And that's great. That sets an example for the rest of the world. But how can we expect Iran not to have nuclear weapons if we, we keep ours? I mean, it's like sitting on a bar still telling people not to drink. Why should we? <laughs> now, the, the, the uh, problem with our weapons is not no rational person would use them, but there have been cases of panic, cases of irrational people. And the closest we came to a nuclear war was in the uh, 50 years ago during the Cuban Missile Crisis. This is one of the Russian missiles that was given to Cuba with atomic weapons on. And we're really lucky that we ended up without a nuclear war then. I took that picture a couple months ago in, in Havana. And a, a, as John said, uh, uh, one person uh, found out about my work and invited me down to Havana. And I gave a talk. In, uh, with Fidel Castro sitting at the front for an hour, and this is a signed picture. Uh, go to my website, you can see more of those. And uh, uh, nine days later, he wrote an essay. He said, while the United States and Russia each committed to reducing their operative nuclear arsenals down to some 2,000 weapons in Prague, 
The only way to prevent a global climate catastrophe from taking place would be by eliminating nuclear weapons. So that's a good sign. He got it. Now I just need the people that have the nuclear weapons still to get it too. Uh, and there's a good sign. There was a, a meeting in Oslo in Norway in March where it's called the Humanitarian Impact of Nuclear Weapons, and 132 nations attended, and they agreed uh, about this. You know, the, there are other weapons of mass destruction that are prohibited by international treaty. You can't use chemical weapons. You can't use cluster munitions. You can't use biological weapons. But nuclear weapons, the worst weapon of mass destruction, is not prohibited. There is no treaty abolishing them. That's what we have to work toward. And all these countries agreed to it. And then there's going to be another meeting in, in Mexico to try and put pressure on the countries with them. So we're going in the right direction. Now you might say, but you know, they're useful. Uh, nuclear weapons are the course of World War II. That's not true. We would already burned 66 cities in Japan. Two more didn't make a difference, and the Jap Japanese gave up because the Russians came to the war. You might say, killing all these people will, build, will win a war. It won't. Killing, killing soldiers will. You might say there's nuclear deterrence. Well, which nuclear, look, look at what happened in the past. The Russians invaded Eastern Europe when the US was the only nuclear power. That didn't deter them. The Argentinians attacked England in the Falkland Islands. England was the one with nuclear weapons. Who won the first Afghanistan war? Who won the second one? The country with nuclear weapons? Who won the war in Vietnam? So nuclear weapons don't deter anybody from attacking you. And uh, you can't prove that they've kept the peace, even though we've been lucky enough not to have a nuclear war. And you, you can't get rid of the, uh, of the knowledge of them, but you can get rid of them. So how have I made you feel? So I'm really sorry. You know, it's been a bummer. I've told you about this horrible thing. Uh, but the question is, what do you do about this information? As Mark Twain said, denial ain't just a river in Egypt. <laughs> the natural thing is to try and forget about it and go home and forget about it. But actually, what you can do is put it to work. You have to work, join the international movement to try and get rid of nuclear weapons. And there's a couple organizations. One's called Global Zero. GlobalZero.org. The other is ICANN, the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, ICANNW.org. And it's, it's, it's starting up in the United States. And you can go to these places and join it and try and rid the world of nuclear weapons so we have the luxury of worrying about all the other problems you've heard about today. <laughs> Thanks very much.